Yeah, thank you for joining us um, today. Um, my name is uh, Stefan Reuter, and uh, I've worked as an IT architect for Deutsche Postbank until uh, 2008, and uh, since then been working as an independent IT consultant, working in different uh, projects uh, for different uh, customers, uh, where authentication and authorization uh, was always uh, a high priority. Um, my basic interests are in IT architecture, so to um, basically figure out where to put a per certain piece of um, functionality within your landscape. Um, software development, um, using multiple languages, um, mainly focused on, on Java and uh, in recent uh, uh, times uh, JavaScript, uh, Go, um, doing um, consulting on uh, development practices like uh, Scrum and uh, DevOps uh, actually bringing stuff into production and running it in a secure environment. Okay. I'm Thomas Cruz. Um, I'm working as an independent IT consultant since uh, the 2000s. I'm a co-founder of the Java User Group in Münster and uh, I founded the Try and Development um, Consultant Agency in Germany in 2011. So, just to give you a picture, uh, we are located in Germany doing um, development, consulting, training and coaching. And that's where security, authentication and authorization uh, comes into the picture because it's always part of uh, our projects. So, uh, organization of this talk. First, I will give you a short introduction to the terminology uh, history of authentication and the history of application landscape so that you can see uh, where the requirements for the current um, technologies originates and um, later on Stefan will present some solutions for you. So, what I often notice is that um, authentication and authorization are uh, not understood fully what is what and how does it work. So, authentication is a process of determining whether someone or something is who or what it is declared to be, so that you can get a grasp of the uh, identity of a thing or a person. This is important because otherwise someone can claim to be a policeman and um, you have to pay money for him, even if he isn't. In the real world, we usually use a passport to identify ourselves, and the process to checking the passport is authentication. What you often have uh, in the context of authentication are users and their credentials. So um, in, in the IT world, you don't have a passport usually, but you have a username and password that are credentials. Uh, you want to manage users, so you put them into groups to uh, make it easier to manage that. A user can have a role. So um, I am a policeman in my work time, but in my free time I'm not a policeman but have a different role. So this is our roles. What you often see in documentation is uh, an abbreviation of the uh, word, it's auth n. Authorization. <coughs> it's a process of giving someone um, permission to do or have something. So usually you first authenticate a person and afterwards he gets some permission to do something. That's authorization. Authorization can be rather complex because depending on the time or the context a person or user is in, it can be different what he's allowed to do or not to do. It um, are conditions uh, that are special. For example, um, if you are an insurance company, you are allowed to um, work with cases up to 2,000 euros, so you can't generalize it. And after 2,000 euros, a different user must come with a different role on permissions. <coughs> so, roles again, and from the roles you get permissions. The usual abbreviation for authorization is offset. A short history, so you can see how the different technologies and processes are built. Usually, about 20 years ago, each system has its own authentication process. So you have one login form per system. 
each user has a username and password for each system. And each system has its own database or configuration file where users are stored. In the context of enterprise environments, this is not practical, so we need some other kind of store. That's where LDAP comes in. It's a hierarchical uh, structure, and it's um, providing you search capabilities, so you can search for users, you can uh, bind to the LDAP and check the credentials of a user. It's often used for uh, shared address books, something like that as well, but mainly the uh, focus in this talk is um, as a storage for user data. Who knows Kerberos? Anyone? Oh, cool. Oh, oh, many people here. Okay. So uh, I don't uh, have to tell you much about it. It was invented in the 1980s. It's uh, ticket based and um, allows something new. It's single sign on across different applications in a single trust domain. Uh, you need mutual trust and authentication in uh, this environment, uh, but it provides some features uh, that you usually want in today's applications as well. Kerberos is widely supported, especially in the Windows domain, and um, yeah, it's, it's some aspects of it we will see later um, are still present in modern systems. Some people may know Radius, it's a remote authentication dial in user service. Special about this is uh, you can not only authenticate to it, but it provides accounting services as well, so how many megabytes did you download? Um, this is a um, quite old protocol as well, and um, it's still use, in use today if you have uh, Wi-Fi uh, where you want a username and password to join it, or if you have port-based security uh, on the LAN. More in the context of uh, web applications, it's uh, SAML. That's uh, since 2005, widely used, especially in the enterprise context. And um, something I think is noteworthy here is the metadata. If you want to have two enterprises to um, federate their authentication systems, you need to configure much stuff where the endpoints and what certificates to use. And the SAML metadata provides this, so you can just exchange one configuration file and in theory it works and most often in practice as well. Uh, another feature is that you have um, the option to have um, the identity provider uh, without any direct connection to the service provider. So the user transports all data between both systems um, in both ways. It's very interesting um, if you have secured a domain which can't um, directly connect to each other. Auth2 is more recent. Um, it provides delegated authorization, especially in the web service context, cloud context, and um, it was later used to provide social login. Facebook, GitHub, Google, they all provide social login in the past based on auth, even, it wasn't, even if it wasn't designed to do login. To make a standard, OpenID Connect was invented, it builds on OS2 and standardizes the lo social login capabilities. So this was a technology history. Now we have, uh, on the other hand, a short um, history of the application landscapes. First, there was a mainframe. Um, you basically did login to the application on the mainframe itself using remote access terminals. Later, there was client-server distributed systems where you have a local area network and usually you have segregated the um, different tiers to make client-server applications. Then came the internet. At first it was low bandwidth with high latency, so um, usually you had special purpose hardware like a modem to dial up to uh, some application, and more or less it was like uh, the mainframe, just a remote terminal. The change with the World Wide Web when uh, applications became accessible to regular end users using a web browser with commodity hardware and software. And that was the, <clears throat> that was, uh, the um, foundation for the cloud as well. So now we have um, a landscape where many services are running in a public or private cloud environment and have to provide elastic scaling. Um, so if you know Salesforce or uh, the uh, Google Apps work, 
this is all running in the cloud and you need authentication for this. You need to provide a way to um, exchange user data and uh, their claims. Microservices is something, um, yeah, like um, when you want to do the cloud stuff in your environment and benefit from all that. And especially with microservices, you have remote connections between each service and you need um, a possibility to transport all the authentication or authorization data between these services on behalf of a user. And you need to have it stateless so you can scale all services independently. So now we are today and want to know what can we do there? What are the requirements for authentication and authorization in today's environment? You need to be fault tolerant because everybody needs to authenticate to so many systems you can't um, afford any downtime. You need to scale independently of the other applications. You need to support delegation to support microservices and you need usually to support some kind of federation. Even if you're inside your own organization, you need to have um, some way to connect to other systems to import the users from there or access the user data from a different system. So it would be great if there would be some standard to integrate um, all the systems, even when they are running with different languages, uh, different platforms and frameworks and to support multi-factor authentication because um, there are so many phishing attacks today. Authorization um, is a little bit uh, less. You need role-based uh, access control to make it manageable. You need fine-grained permissions, like I said earlier. You um, have some use cases where you really have fine-grained um, access controls and you need to support independent evolution of your microservices. So there should be no tight coupling between them just to provide authentication or authorization. And you need to uh, have some kind of central overview and management because that's uh, what you usually have um, as a requirement from your management. So now we need a solution. I hope you can provide Thank you. it. So based on these requirements, um, we can sketch out uh, a solution that can uh, function as kind of a blueprint for um, your general needs for authentication and authorization within this world of uh, microservices and multiple applications uh, that are running at scale. If we start with this, then first we need a central store for users and credentials. And depending on the scale, you're going to deploy your application. This can be as easy as a central LDAP server, like an Active Directory, if you're working already with, with Microsoft products within your enterprise. Or if you scale up, you will probably go with some NoSQL databases, like Cassandra or a key value store, something that uh, scales in the same way as your application is opposed to scale. And you will put in all your, your users, the credentials of your users, like passwords, of course, uh, hashed so that, uh, that they're not stored in, in plain text, or any other credentials that you want to manage. So this could include um, the, the seeds for two-factor authentication devices, like time-based uh, one-time passwords. It could be um, the common names of certificates that you're using to identify. Whatever fits into this goes into a central store um, that is distributed and that is used to um, account your users and credentials. Uh, to access this uh, store, you will use a central authentication system. So um, the reason for this is that authentication is actually a domain on its own. So uh, if you've heard about domain-driven design and uh, the idea of, of bounded contexts and of um, uh, domain-specific languages, then you will easily find out that uh, the domain of authentication with all the, um, the different requirements is something that you want to isolate from your application because if you do it on your own, then you have to implement a whole bunch of things like a sign-up process for new users, 
or password policies where say a password must have a, a specific length or must contain special characters, password will expire, all these things um, go into the domain of a central authentication system and the authentication domain. Um, we will also want to implement a change password function so that your users can change their password whenever uh, they, they choose to or when they are forced to by the policy. Um, you will be um, implementing a forgot password uh, function. You will probably want a capture uh, if you are t uh, noticing that uh, users uh, have uh, tried to log in with incorrect correct credentials multiple times to make sure that uh, there is no brute force attacks going on. And uh, sometimes you want a remember me function uh, to make it more easy for users to come back and uh, do not have to enter their password all the time. So all those features, and this is only a small list of the total uh, amount of features that you would have to implement, um, they should go into a central service that is actually responsible for all things regarding authentication um, and that you only implement once uh, or maybe even uh, that you buy off the shelf because um, of uh, the, the uh, reuse that you can make. It's nothing that uh, separates your company from other companies. It's just something that you should buy if uh, you find a product that fits your requirements. So now that we have a central authentication system, we want the user to be able to log in. So to facilitate this, most systems today are using browser-based logins, whether this is um, directly from a, from a desktop browser or on the mobile device with a mobile browser. Uh, most of the systems are browser-based, but your authentication system will also have to support uh, login from desktop applications, if you're running a JavaFX application, for example, or if you're running an SAP system with a UI, um, whatever this is, you will want to have a desktop application be able to log in to, just by providing credentials to the authentication system. The same goes for mobile applications, if you have native Android or iPhone applications, you will want to be able to authenticate uh, with those devices too. So what does authentication and login actually mean? It means that you provide your credentials to this central service and you get something in return. And this uh, thing that you get in return should actually be a proof of the validation that the authentication system has done. And in modern systems that are able to, to scale, um, this will probably be a token. So you exchange your password and your username and password or whatever other credentials you have for a token that proves that the authentication service actually has validated your identity and um, that you are actually yourself. So let's have a look at the tokens in more detail. Um, those tokens provide a level of indirection. So, in exchange for their credentials, the users uh, receive a token that they can use, and the token is then presented to resource providers, so actually your applications or your microservices, your cloud-based resources, um, instead of the credentials, so that you can gain access. The big advantage of this is that you're actually preventing your services or your resource providers from having to deal with the passwords. They never see them, they only see those tokens, and those tokens usually have a very limited lifetime, so they are only valid for a few minutes or maybe for, for, for a few hours, but um, afterwards they are useless, and um, so it's... Um, much more uh, secure to deal with those tokens for your application than to actually see the real uh, credentials of a user. A token can be either an opaque structure, so it's just a string with no actual meaning inside that you have to resolve somewhere, or it can be uh, structured data. So it could be an XML document, for example. This is what SAML does. A SAML assertion is basically uh, just a token or it could be uh, some kind of a JSON format that is maybe base64 uh, encoded so that it can be transmitted more easily, but um, that the token actually contains information inside. Examples of those um, tokens include um, access token and the refresh token that you may be familiar with uh, from OAuth2, um, 
or it can be an OpenID Connect ID token. Uh, there you would uh, use a JOT token. This is actually an example of a JSON-based structure that contains all the information. So a state-of-the-art token um, has a few requirements that I would like to show you. Um, first of all, it, is, it should be stateless, so that you don't need to keep any state. This is different from your normal session ID, because if you have a session ID, then this uh, information does not help you much. Um, only, it, it only makes sense if you actually um, look it up in your session database, in your memory, or wherever you store the session data. A good state-of-the-art token would be stateless so that your application does not have to keep any state and it's self-contained. It should also support local validation. Local validation means that just by having a look at the token, you can tell whether this token is valid or not, so whether it was um, issued by a trusted uh, authentication service or just something the user made up uh, by himself. It should also be lightweight. That means um, that it should be small in size, that it should be easy to parse. So, for example, the SAML assertion would not qualify as lightweight because you need a full-fledged uh, XML parser. You would need um, additional support for XML signatures and XML encryption. Um, and um, also um, would be difficult to uh, implement this in very small devices. So, easy to parse would be part of the requirements for a state-of-the-art token. It should be short-lived, so um, that uh, it's not a token that you issue once and it's valid for like years. For example, an um, uh, SSL certificate that is issued for a server uh, that is valid for like three years would not qualify here. And um, it should be um, uh, so that it can be part of every request that you send to the server. This also resembles to the, to the small size. One good example of those tokens uh, that are actually gaining uh, popularity is the JOT token. Uh, this is what it looks like. It's basically a base64 uh, um, encoded uh, piece of information. And if you're looking uh, very closely at it, you will see that there are actually two dots inside that separate the three parts of the JOT token. Um, and uh, this uh, resembles to the header, the payload, and the signature of this header. So actually, the header just says which algorithm is used and that it is a JOT token. The payload includes all the data that you want to include into the token. This is uh, the subject. Um, actually identifying the, the, the kind of a user ID if you're using it for users, but it could be basically everything that is, um, that is a valid uh, identifier. Then you have a name, you have whatever you want to put in there. There are some reserved claims that are defined uh, by the specification, like an issuer or uh, the audience uh, or an expiration date to make it short-lived. Um, and finally, you have the signature that actually um, includes a cryptographic um, uh, signature of uh, the header and the payload to make sure uh, that the token has not been tampered with. Um, all these parts are then uh, encoded uh, with base64 and put into, um, yeah, uh, separated by dots and then used as a string that can be passed around. And as you saw, the JOT token is rather small, so you could include it in an HTTP header, for example, and it wouldn't be much larger than uh, your usual session ID. So if you're using those tokens, then the next step would be to actually present the token to the application and say, OK, I did the, the um, validation of my identity at the authentication provider and received a token in return, and then I will present it to my application. And the application will then be able to check the token by checking the signature and um, reading the content. Um, this is a basic architecture that you can use. Um, without uh, using any standard at all if you don't want to. You can use it just as a, as a blueprint and implement it on your own. But you could also uh, use a standard, and that's actually what we are recommending. Um, so, for example, SAML or OpenID Connect, uh, both of them define a standard for uh, those tokens, define a standard for the process to um, present the token to the application and to obtain it in the first place. 
So um, the state of the art uh, thing would be OpenID Connect because it's lightweight and it works well with uh, the cloud infrastructure that we are used to deploy our applications to. So um, OpenID Connect um, actually defines um, a standard protocol for the process to obtain this token for authentication. Um, it defines how to validate the, the token, so what does the application have to do um, after it received the token to check that it's actually valid, and it also defines a token format for this. What it does not include is the actual login process and the credentials that are used, so there any implementation is free to use whatever uh, the, the security requirements uh, uh, will, will lead you to. This could be as easy as a username and password. It could include two-factor authentication. It could include smart cards, whatever. This is not uh, predefined by the specification. The specification just, just says uh, how the flow between the authentication service and the application is. OpenID Connect is actually based on OAuth 2. So um, it's a standard that builds up on another standard that had already been um, quite popular and uh, that was used for the social logins like Google and GitHub and Facebook did, but it now is a standard that can be used in the enterprise as well. And it uses uh, JOT as the token format, as we saw before, so um, that those tokens are self-contained and uh, cryptographically secured. OpenID Connect also uh, offers multiple flows, so it supports um, a setup where you are running a browser-based application and have a central service that is running server-side in a secure environment, but it also supports untrusted clients like a mobile application that is running on the user's uh, smartphone or an, an application that is running in the user's browser in, in JavaScript where you also don't have control over the execution environment. and um, do not trust the execution environment. Both um, scenarios are covered by the OpenID Connect specification. Um, in contrast to SAML, which is rather, um, yeah, uh, development of, of SAML has stalled in 2005. It's a specification that is, can be considered finished. This is in contrast to OpenID Connect, which still keeps evolving, but this also means that we have the option to actually um, make it support modern flows and um, in integrate modern um, requirements, which is not the case with uh, SAML. So if we have a look at uh, the flow, then the typical um, scenario is that you don't go to the authentication provider and say, okay, I want to log in, here are my credentials, give me the token, but the user usually goes to the application first, says, okay, I want to use this feature on this application. Um, so they access the application, and if the user is not authenticated, then the, uh, the application will redirect the user to the central authentication server, and uh, the central authentication server will then provide a login form. The user will log in with whatever credentials uh, the authentication provider requires and will return a token in exchange and redirect the user back to the application. So then the, the browser can present the token to the application and the application can validate the token and make sure that the user is actually who he claims to be. Yes. Yes, there can be, and this is basically a, this is actually a recommended a scenario for OpenID Connect. Um, the question was if there is a connection between the application one and the authentication provider. Um, so yes, um, usually there is, um, if you want to obtain additional information, but it can also be used with just the token, then you will just validate the ID token. Um, if you go on with this and want to add additional applications, then this is rather easy, because now we can um, just add additional applications. And um, like, like, for example, an application two, this could be a, an application that we develop on our own, could also be an application of a third party, and this is where it actually pays off to have uh, something that is based on standards, because chances are rather good that uh, the standard is supported by those uh, third-party applications. And the um, way it works is um, 
uh, just similar. You present um, a token to this application, and this token can either be the same token or it can be a different token, depending on what you actually uh, want to achieve with this. So if you want to do single sign-on, um, you can either use the same token, yeah, as I just said. Um, you can uh, store this token, for example, in a cookie. You could use HTML5 local storage and then present it to those applications. Um, this usually makes sense if your applications are um, closely related, if they are operated by the same organization and in the same security zone. Or you could say, I want to keep uh, tokens private to an application so that the token <coughs> can only be used for one application and that the application cannot steal the token and use it to authenticate or impersonate to another application. And uh, then you would issue um, a separate uh, token to each application. This, of course, means that um, the authentication server will have to be contacted if the user switches between application. Uh, between applications, but the user will not notice this because uh, the user um, will just be redirected again as long as he has an active session with the authentication provider. So maybe he will just see a short flickering on his screen because he gets redirected, but um, there will be no interaction. And the benefit of this is, of course, that you have a, a increased security as the tokens are totally bound to an application and are only valid for this application. Yeah, if you're doing single sign-on, then you also want the opposite of this, so basically single sign-out. This is a bit more uh, complicated um, because um, you actually need this communication now um, that we've talked about before, um, the authentication server now has to notify all those applications that are taking part within this trust domain and invalidate those tickets. Um, so uh, the flow would be that the user requests a logout at uh, one of the applications. The application would trigger a central logout at the, at the authentication service and the, the authentication service would then notify all those applications and invalidate the tokens to tell them that um, uh, the session is no longer valid. Um, this looks a bit easier here on this slide as it actually is, because usually your application uh, will run on multiple nodes, and this um, notification is just one HTTP call, so within this application the notification must be propagated to um, all the nodes of the application so that everybody is informed. Um, yeah, what you do is um, that you request the logout and um, notify those registered applications. The OpenID Connect uh, specification uh, uses um, tokens here that are in um, compliance with the security event token. So again, the OpenID Connect is building up on established standards uh, for this, and the security event token is uh, just a specification of a JOT token um, that contains information about security-relevant events. If you don't want to do this and don't want to have um, this back-channel um, communication between the authentication provider and the um, applications, then you could also use a front-channel logout. This is even a bit newer in the OpenID Connect specification than the back-channel logout, and it works for um, environments that are fully built for the, for the web and do not use any applications because it heavily relies on the, on the browser. And um, actually, it means that uh, you are going to destroy all the cookies and HTML uh, local storage information um, in the browser so that you don't invalidate the tickets at the back ends, but invalidate or remove the tickets from the front end. And um, yeah, you can also use this if you are um, in a, in a web-based world to monitor the session uh, validity uh, via an iframe. Uh, that means that you're constantly polling the authentication uh, service to actually check whether you are still uh, um, active or not. The whole scenario also works quite well for using microservices. So um, if, you're, uh, if you've built your application uh, as a set of microservices instead of uh, uh, a monolithic application, 
then you can use the same tokens that you obtained uh, for, um, uh, for, for login and that have been presented by the browser um, and pass them on internally between your microservices. Um, this is a nice thing because now you are able to not only pass on a username or whatever you would have, would have done in the past to um, provide uh, some kind of a, a global traceability, but you can include everything that is part of the authentication token. So this can include roles of the user, it can include um, the, the signature, and you just use the token and pass it on. For the transport, you can use uh, HTTP uh, to communicate within uh, your microservice architecture. Then you would use an HTTP header to um, propagate the, um, the token, or you can use messaging, asynchronous communication, and you could make it part of the payload either or put it into the header of a message. Usually, if you are going with this approach, then you would have different uh, tokens per application and uh, would use the same token within this application. So you, for, for this scenario, you would have two uh, tokens. One would be used by all services of the application two, and one token would be used by the application one. With OpenID Connect and a central authentication service, you can also use um, federation. So federation is the idea that you do not have multiple applications, or maybe you have, but you also have multiple user bases. This could be either internal to your organization, or it could be external user bases. An external user base in an enterprise environment is usually um, kind of a partner organization or a customer uh, organization that is large enough that you want to integrate them with your system. But it could also be um, the user base of, say, Google or Facebook, where you want to use uh, a social login and say, uh, if uh, Google verified the identity of this user, then I will trust this and um, use it for my applications too. So you will have an additional authentication uh, server that is uh, operated by the other organization and um, you will um, incorporate it in your authentication uh, system so um, that your applications do not notice whether it is a, a user that is from your own user base or from a third party that is trusted. Federation means um, integration of those third-party user bases. We, we saw those examples of uh, social login or enterprise B2B. Enterprise B2B actually is a quite a common use case because we have a lot of customers um, that want to uh, offer their services uh, to a larger um, customer of theirs. And they have an existing user base, for example, a company who wants to sell uh, tickets for uh, public transport. Uh, then they say, okay, if you want to integrate your users, then we integrate uh, your user base and offer them a portal where they can order tickets, for example. And this is a good use case uh, for a federation based on OpenID Connect or SAML. Um, the federation use case is also a very good example of where SAML2 is still in, in wide use because it's um, used, by, uh, used in enterprise environments. It's available out of the box in Active Directory and um, modern authentication service support federation based on SAML2, whether they are themselves SAML2 compliant servers or whether they are OpenID Connect servers, you can translate between them by using an appropriate um, uh, authentication service. So now we uh, come to authorization and uh, Thomas will uh, show you how to integrate this. Okay, thanks. <clears throat> okay, now that we know who a user is or what claims he has, uh, we still have the challenge to um, authorize, authorize uh, the um, uh, actions he wants to do. So usually this is um, how the architecture would look like. You have the central authentication provider uh, having the users authenticated, uh, identified by the credentials, and a user has roles. In each of your applications, you would do a mapping from the role to the permission a user has. And later on, you check um, what permissions are required to perform some actions or to um, display uh, the UI. So, for example, if, if you're not an um, 
uh, allowed to do administrative actions. You don't see any delete or edit buttons in the UI. This is all checked using the permissions in the application. This worked well with microservices as well. If you don't have one application, but many microservices, they can each check um, what uh, permissions are derived from a role and then check if the permissions are in place for an operation. So the question is what would I have in a central place and what would I do uh, locally in an application or a microservice? Usually, as you have seen, we would do the central authentication because we we'll all have all the benefits of having this in one place. It's one uh, domain supporting the uh, complete um, system, so you don't want to distribute it and re-implement it every everywhere. You will have the uh, roles managed in some central place and you then get the consistent results across all your systems. And it's easier to manage as well if you have to go th uh, through all systems and create the, uh, the roles manually there or as a developer that uh, doesn't work good. But authorization has to be done at the place an action is performed because only that application or that service knows what permissions are really required to do that. So role mapping is something to do locally as well and this promotes some kind of loose coupling because otherwise each service would have to um, to tell the central place what permissions they have in place if a developer adds a new UI element which is um, related to a permission. This permission has to be managed centrally. That wouldn't uh, scale and um, lead to very tight coupling uh, and release trains. You don't want that. But the management should be something you can consider to do centrally. So if we create an API for each microservice, which uh, is able to tell a central management system which roles are there, um, sorry, which permissions are there, you can gather them all, you can push all central roles to the um, microservices, and um, you, you can make some central UI where you can manage all that. So, for example, you have um, a new role, and then you can push that out to all microservices uh, from the central management application using an API, and each microservice then does the mapping from the role to the permissions. So what you need in a, a cloud world as well is the possibility to delegate authorization. This is important if you have some external entities or partners uh, where you want to perform an action on behalf on one of your local users. And for this use case, which is usually found in B2B environments, uh, you have some protocol to delegate the authorization. This is, uh, like I said, for software as a service offerings or even uh, an API as a service. What you will often find is Auth2 to, to implement this. This is a standard protocol. Like we heard earlier, OpenID Connect is built on this protocol but the protocol itself is really only for authorization and this is what uh, is the scope of this. So, um, we have seen how to do authentication and authorization in general, but what technologies are available? How could you as a Java developer um, benefit uh, from this talk? You can go on with uh, uh, playing around with Keycloak. It's um, an open source offering that you can uh, run locally or for your enterprise. It provides authentication um, and as, as a software appliance. The same goes for uh, the ThinkTexture Identity Server. It's uh, built in C-sharp. And there are other offerings as well. So you can run on-premise this uh, central authentication server and um, yes, you don't have to write your own, please don't or use tools and frameworks that support that. Question? Oh, okay. You can use it as a service as well. If uh, you don't run um, all the infrastructure for that in your uh, company, you can use Auth0, you can use Stormpath, or um, from Amazon, the Cognito 
And this works as well. So with all these standards in place, you um, really benefit from the cloud in uh, this domain as well. Now you have to uh, think about how can I implement this in my application. There's uh, Java E as a standard. It's an uh, uh, API standard, JS, but it's only um, implemented in, in by all the container vendors. So um, you might consider doing another thing. Um, what you can use, which is really working, the standard way are client certificates, and um, this works across all Java E servers. Spring Security, of course, is very flexible and provides solutions for uh, OAuth 2 and uh, Open Con uh, OpenID Connect as well. So uh, this is what might fit you and uh, it's really well documented. There are other libraries as well which you could use in your applications. Uh, you should really do some research what fits well for your technology stack. Uh, most of the authentication providers um, I talked earlier about provide vendor-specific adapters, so you can use some library um, from them and integrate it really easy in your application, but then you get some coupling between your application and the provider of your um, uh, authentication service. You might not want to do that, but on the other hand, it can be really easy and a uh, fast way to achieve it. What you can do as well, especially uh, if you're thinking about uh, IoT and machine-to-machine um, -machine communication, is uh, to think a little bit outside of the box and use um, client certificates. This is an interesting thing because uh, it allows you to uh, offload authentication to the infrastructure. It's all well known and understood, and you can really easily uh, integrate that into um, your um, environment. This can be used as a substitution for token-based solutions as well. But on the other hand, you can complement it to model a trust relationship. Like we saw earlier, you usually have some uh, application which consists of some microservices which uh, don't really need to be on the same network or a trusted environment. You can use client certificates to express this trust relationship um, if you run some stuff outside uh, of your organization. And uh, it really fits for machine-to-machine -machine communication. So if you have some IoT stuff, then there's, uh, you might want to use some kind of mutual authentication on the infrastructure level to um, make sure that all the sensor data is coming from the right system uh, and to the right system and nowhere else. What's nice about this, uh, it doesn't have a central component. So it's um, between each client and server on, as part of the infrastructure. And you don't need uh, the authentication server. But certificate rollout and management is rather complex. So you um, don't uh, want to use it for each user, but more for machine-to-machine -machine use cases. Uh, and what's really sad about this is um, we don't have uh, some way to make federation work with this um, client certificates. It's not like a token. You can't pass it around um, and have um, the benefits we saw earlier. So think about it like um, an orthogonal layer on this. OK, that's all we wanted to show you. Uh, we assume there are many questions, so just come ahead. Yeah. Yes? Uh, the question was that um, if you have um, a small IoT device and the user is authenticating um, uh, to this device and the token is short-lived, how can you manage it to work over several years? Is that correct? Yeah. Great. So um, there are several kinds of tokens. Usually you have um, an access token which is uh, short-lived and which is used to delegate access. And uh, this is sent and, and passed around between all the transitive services. You have a different kind of token. It's um, called a refresh token or even an offline token, which has a very, very much longer lifespan. And this 
token is only used between the authentication server and the client which is um, uh, getting the token. So this is not passed around and can be considered to be secure. So this token works like user credentials. It's uh, very long lived and you can use this token to get new access token whenever you need. So this is something for the cloud as well if you have some external service which should be able to act on behalf of the user even if the user is not online you can get an access to uh, sorry an offline token from the authentication provider and use that for an uh, indefinite long lifespan. Does it answer the question? Great. So yes. Okay. Any more questions? Thank you. There's time left, so <laughs> let's get. Okay, um, it was hard to understand you. So the question was, um, if I have many microservices, would I have one token for all these services or would I have different tokens for all the services and if so, where would I store that? Is that correct? So we have the, they all share the same authorization, they're all, all part of, of one application, so it, it doesn't really change, but we don't want to manage it for each microservice, so we're thinking about storing it in, in, in the central repository, but then if, if you get uh, call outs, uh, the, the, each microservice calls another one, he calls it, so they all have the same, uh, hit the same repo, and then you have again an, an, uh, a single point of failure that if the one repo is still there. So if you have um, a trust domain where yeah. all your microservices are living in, then you would have one token inside this domain and use this one token. Yeah. You wouldn't use a different token for each microservices a service, even if it's in the same domain. If you have um, some uh, separate applications or trust domains, then you would use different tokens for these both domains. And then you have one microservice that is shared in different domains, it will have to understand. You, you yeah. wouldn't share a microservice in different trust domains. You would deploy this service in multiple domains as a separate instance. Yes. Uh, okay. Thanks. Yeah, you're welcome. More questions? We have five minutes left. Okay, then thank you. Thank you. <laughs>